please join me in giving a very warm welcome to the 2009 Voiceless Animal Law Lecture Series special guest, Bruce Wagman. I really can't thank you all enough for coming and thank Voiceless enough for having me here. It's really my honor and privilege to be here in this room, in this wonderful room filled with so many people. The fact that you were here proves the legitimacy, not only of the movement, but of what Justice Kirby said in his opinion and other judges have said in America in their opinions. Animal law is a matter of public concern. It's a matter that's on people's minds. Whether you are somebody who is ready to go and ready to fight for the animals or just interested, merely the fact that you are here demonstrates that this is something that our society is interested in and needs to address. This morning we had a, a QC, an MP, a judge. This, this evening we have Justice Kirby and others. It is quite impressive. It is rare even in America that we get these many esteemed people showing up. What I've been asked to do is tell you a little bit about my history, how I got to the point where I am today with respect to my practice as an animal lawyer, and then to discuss some particular cases. And I'm going to lead you through a, a bunch of cases as we go through. But first, we're going to look at this nice picture, two dogs and a woman on a beach. And I'm going to tell you that I brought this picture out last night, and Professor Sankoff brought out almost an identical picture. My picture's from Stinson Beach, California. His was from some beach in New Zealand. We debated about who had a better beach, but <laughs> the point is we both had that picture. And I suspect many of you have some similar picture or a picture of an animal. The point is that the things I'll be talking about today are worldwide. They're global. It's not, I'm going to talk about American law, but it's not just happening in America. It's not just happening in Australia. It's happening everywhere. And I mean both the concern for animals and the abuse and torture and suffering of animals. I first came to animal law almost by mistake. There was a busy job, one I wanted a break from. There was an American Bar Association conference, said something about animals. I had dogs and cats. I thought I'd go. I walked in. I found out about the way animals were treated in America. And I walked out with a revelation, the only one I've ever had in my life. And I said, I can't participate in the suffering anymore. And I'm going to do what I can to change. And over the last 17 years, my practice has gone from one pro bono case here and there with respect to animal law to what I describe as a seven day a week, 150% time animal law practice. For the last five years, that's basically all I've done. So now we're going to run through a bunch of cases and clients, if you will, that I've had over the years. That was my first client. He's a tule elk. He lives in, in the Point Reyes National Seashore in California. And he and about 300 of his family were put on this land to get away from a disease called brucellosis that was not named after me. <laughs> over time, they did very well. They got over the disease and they spread. And on the, that land as well were a bunch of ranchers who had been given 99-year leases for $1 to continue their use and exploitation of animals in farming situations. And so the first case was to try to get them off the land. That first case was a good example of what, how to be an animal lawyer and how not to be an animal lawyer. Don't take a case that requires federal statutes, tries to get people who have been on the land for 500 years off it when you've been out of school for three weeks. <laughs> Doesn't work. Um, so we lost, and that's another point. Peter has said it, Justice Kirby's referred to it. We are trying to change the world here. We're going to lose. Every social justice reform movement, every civil rights movement has a lot of losing cases be before the success finally comes. What we have that's not going to stop is the passion and the heart to continue. When I lost a, a case pretty badly early on, but it was a total situation of a judge just not acknowledging the interest of animals, I called up Joyce Tischler, the head of the Animal Legal Defense Fund, in tears. And she said, Bruce, the bad news for them is you're not going away. And that's where we're at today. Here's a list of many uh, American animal protection organizations, some of which may be familiar to you, some of which aren't, but you can sort of tell what they all do, and they've all been clients at one time or another. I, I like sometimes, because I'm an animal lover, to list my clients by species. So I've had chimpanzees, gibbons, gorillas, lions, dogs, cats, elephants, seals, dolphins, uh, and millions and millions of animals involved in factory farming. Dolphins. We learn a lot 
as animal lawyers. That's one of the exciting things about it. It's an intellectually challenging field because we're trying to take the square peg of animals and put it in the round hole of the law, someplace that's never been before, and try to convince judges to understand that they can do that as well. But we also learn the facts of things that may look okay to us on their face, like a swim with the dolphin program. I thought swim with the dolphins programs, I'd never been involved in one, but it sounded pretty cool. You get in a pool with a dolphin and they pull you around. And boy, it's every kid's dream. Turns out those dolphins are seriously drugged. They're on constant drugs for their digestive system because they have ulcers, and they're on antidepressants all the time because they're locked in a situation they can never get out of. We are not supposed to be with dolphins. So my next case was to try to stop a swim with the dolphins program in Reno, Nevada. I know you're from Australia. You may not realize it. You may have heard of Las Vegas. It's a really horrible place that we're usually embarrassed about if we're from America. Well, Reno's like the slums of Las Vegas. I hope there's nobody from Reno here. It's, my point really is it's not a place for dolphins. They don't belong there, and that's what we fought. We talk about companionship a lot. Many of you may have companion animals. That's what brings many people to animal law, their dogs or their cats. How much would you pay for your dog or your cat? Most many people would say, not a million dollars would I give him or her up for. So many of the cases in animal law these days in America are lawsuits over injuries or deaths of animals. What would you do if somebody came in and killed one of those animals who happened to be mine? How do you value them is the question. How do judges take this piece of property and decide what the real value is? Now, we've talked about property, but appreciate this. My dogs and my cats aren't worth as much as this bottle of water. I got them from the pound that they were about to kill them. They were worthless in the eyes of the law, in the market, the day I got them. They've devalued in price. From a strictly market perspective, I should pay somebody who kills them. But that's obviously not the way we value animals. So we try to value what that companionship is. What price do you put on a piece of property whose only value is the benefit that he or she brings you, whether medical, therapeutic, or companionship. There has to be a way to value that. And more and more judges are appreciating that. But the law still says property. But there are ways to change it. And that's a whole nother lecture. Custody cases are very big. This case is the plaintiff, the dog, versus the cat saying, who gets the bed? <laughs> but seriously, custody cases are big in America these days. And while they're sometimes just between two couples who are bickering and using the dog as the, as the pawn, just like people use children, we do take on cases in which we're trying to decide the animal's best interest. If the animal's best interest is, is at issue, that changes everything. Because in general, again, they're property. You get the Cadillac, she gets the dog. But if we can get a judge to say, wait, I'm going to consider where the dog goes based on who treats the dog better, that actually is from the perspective of the dog. And that's so important. And so that, that increases the value of animals because it takes that piece of property and turns them into something different. I like to call it quasi-property. They're not people. We're never going to say they're people, but they're not property. They're not this bottle. Another custody case. <laughs> Here's where it gets ugly. And by ugly, I don't mean really ugly like the dogs aren't ugly, but this world is ugly. This is a horrible place for animals, for many animals. Many of you have animals who probably are asleep on the pillow right now, whether you know it or not. <laughs> but these animals never left that cage. I do a lot of work on cases that are known as hoarding cases or collector cases. In the past four years, I've had four cases, and those four cases alone involved 1,100 animals kept by four people in situations like this. They never leave the cage. The cages are never cleaned. They live and breathe in their urine and feces for months and months and months. Many of them are breeders. They're breeders and they're hoarders. The animals suffer badly. They're stacked constantly. If you're at the bottom of the stack of four crates, you know what comes down all the time. These people don't change that. And the animals suffer very, very badly. And number one, we have what most of you can appreciate whether you have companion animals or not, confinement, the confinement that we're going to talk about even more with pigs and cows. These dogs never get out to do anything. They never get any interaction. We have trained domestic animals to be with us. These animals get no human interaction, get no human connection, nor do they even get time to do anything with themselves. But even worse than that, if it could be worse, is the physical disease. 
Here's one of the dogs from the 550 dogs and 21 birds we took from a couple in Sanford, North Carolina. The couple were both 68 going on about 85. And what they did is not take care of 550 dogs. Every once in a while they walked around and threw some food in. But the problems we see in these cases are exhibited by this female Pomeranian here. Almost no teeth and blind. Eye, eye problems and teeth problems are rampant in hoarding cases. Why is that? Because of the nutrition and the um, lack of sanitation is so bad that their teeth literally fall out of their mouths. Their jaws literally rot out. Now let's stop a moment here and stop getting clinical and get real about what we're talking about. We're talking about mammals. They feel just the same way as we do. The empirical research referred to earlier that we've done is that a dog feels tooth pain just like you or I. These dogs had their teeth rot out of their mouths. You know how quickly you go to the dentist when you've got a little toothache, you can't even see it. They've been suffering for six months, nine months, years, and never gotten any treatment. The 550 dogs at this facility had never seen a veterinarian. So again, it's really important to bring home to all of us, and especially to the outside world, to judges, that mammals, as well as birds, feel the same way we do. They may speak a different language about that feeling, but it's there, and the science is there. We use veterinarians on a regular basis in cases to demonstrate to judges. This is not some crazy, animal-loving, uh, anthropocentric human saying, oh, Dusty just doesn't feel good. This is a veterinarian who can say this pain is exactly the same. And it's worse for animals. We understand if we're in pain, we may get out of it. Many of you may appreciate that your dog thinks now is forever. Like when you go away for 12 hours, you come home and he goes crazy. You go away for two minutes, you come home and he goes crazy. <laughs> they live in this kind of filthy environment, absolutely deprived of everything. Almost all the hoarding situations are the same. Some of them are much worse, with cannibalism and dead animals around. And I should say, I apologize for the graphic nature, but I don't really apologize because I want you to see the reality. But what I should tell you is I'm not showing you the bad pictures, believe it or not. And this is really the most graphic picture I've got to show you about hoarding. In that 550 uh, dog facility, there were 10 boxes like this. In each box, there were somewhere between four and eight dogs. This is not a trick. They're, the other two sides of this box are the same as the sides you're looking at. The tops were, in some cases, nailed shut. Occasionally, every two weeks, they threw some food in. That was it, life in a dark box for these animals. That's the kind of situations we see on a regular basis. Hoarding is not uh, an erratic situation. It is epidemic in America and, I think, around the world. It's definitely the number one threat to companion animals in America. We have a, a reported 700 cases a year. That's just what's reported. That's like saying how many reports have there been of marijuana smoking this year. Then you multiply by how many are not seen. So it is a major problem. It's not limited to companion animals. We had a 700 to 800 exotic animal hoarding situation, uh, which included chimpanzees, monkeys, all sorts of cats. Not to mention, again, the sanitation. They estimated there were over 200,000 rats in this particular facility, and they weren't being kept as hoarding facility, at the hoarding facility. <laughs> mountain lions, an American icon. So when they discovered that there were 125 mountain lions somewhere in the Black Hills of South Dakota, they decided, hey, let's kill them. Let's have a hunt. Now, we'll be real careful, and we'll make sure we don't kill them all, and we'll also um, make sure that there's plenty of restraints on what's happening. And besides, you really never see a mountain lion. So we sued the state of South Dakota and tried to stop the hunt. Again, we lost, despite the fact that the testimony from the other side was that the hunting would probably, uh, could likely cause the extinction of the mountain lions. Despite that, the judge said the hunt can go on. And one of the big defenses was, we'll never see a mountain lion. You never kill them. This is... This is 24 hours after we lost. This mountain lion had a, had a cub near her who was then picked up and taken to a research facility. Experimentation of animals is constant, and we all know that, and we all hate to look at these pictures. And again, I apologize, but this is a big issue in animal law. The Animal Welfare Act in America does very little to protect these animals, other than very minimum restraints on exactly how they are housed. And I've been involved in several cases which do our best to provide for these animals when they're not in research. 
whatever you think about research, and I understand the controversy and I understand the desire to cure diseases, is this okay? Another big issue in every, every population is domestic animals, and too many of them. In America, we euthanize four to five million domestic animals every single year. This is a dog being lowered into a cage, with it, which will then be pushed, pushed into the gas chamber where they will be euthanized. Now, don't gasp right away because gassing is legal in 43 states in America and is an approved method of euthanasia in many areas. If done correctly and properly, it's probably almost as good as euthanasia by injection. But it just so happened the state of Georgia had decided they didn't approve of it because they felt it was too bad. Despite that, and this reflects not so much just in the state of Georgia, but in the state of humanity's feeling about animals, the state of Georgia, Department of Agriculture, the commissioner, one of the top officials in the state, had gone around to shelters and said, despite the law that said no uh, gas chambers, you guys should buy a gas chamber. We had documents. They weren't even hiding it. It wasn't even really hard, except suing the state of Georgia is not easy by anybody, especially a California lawyer. Despite that, we got the right judge, and that judge ruled that the Department of Agriculture had to stop their practices. And so overnight, we shut down the illegal gas chambers in Georgia. This is the kind of success that really just makes your day, makes your life. Overnight, we stopped the suffering of some 10,000 animals in Georgia, year by year by year, going forward forever. And the, the evidence was, unfortunately, that in Georgia, gas chamber euthanasia was not done correctly, and animals were suffering in a horrible ways. Here's another one of those bubbles that gets burst. There's a cute little chimp you see on TV or in the movies, right? Well, he is cute, but to get him to put those clothes on, He's been beaten with bats and sticks and chains and kicked and, and abused in ways that you can't even imagine. Every single chimpanzee who shows up in a movie or television has had that done to him. This is not the animal rights activist talking. This is testimony from Jane Goodall, who many of you have probably heard of. Testimony from Roger Fouts, probably the world's leader in captive chimpanzee training. And maybe even more importantly than the experts we know so well, it's testimony from inside the industry. That's how we get uh, exotic animals to perform for us. It's not funny. It's not cute. But we don't see that. And as Justice Kirby mentioned and as uh, Professor Sankoff mentioned, it's what we don't know that we need to know that I think will change us. You folks came here tonight to learn about something, as brutal as it may be to learn and to walk out with that knowledge. But that knowledge will empower us to change. And as strange as it may be, in the very small niche of animal law, I've developed this sub-niche of chimpanzee law, partly because of this, because of this knowledge, but also because chimpanzees have been sort of separated out for us as humans because, as many of you may know, they're so close to us. They share 98.7% of our DNA. I, I never quite understand why we're above them in the evolutionary scale because they seem to have it a lot better down, but nevertheless, there they are. But there's that chimp. And here's Taya, who we rescued, who had her head split open by a lock, like a combination lock, by her trainer, and ended up in surgery. So we do our best, and I've done two or three cases trying to get animals out of entertainment. There are amazing exemptions for the use of animals in entertainment in America, coupled because they're coupled with the exemptions for the use of animals in research. And chimpanzees were, at one point in time, considered the primary research specimen for AIDS research. But setting aside the research issue, would any of you say, I would like to see that chimpanzee on TV, and it's OK with me if he got beat with a chain for me to see that? I bet there's nobody who will come forward and say yes. Also, because chimpanzees are so close to us, we have tried to establish some personhood status. And I don't mean just the same as us. We're not advocating that they can vote or or buy cars or drive cars, but something more than property, because there is such a connection. They understand us. They are so curious. They are so intelligent. Um, they also apparently like tattoos. See tattoo, tattoo. Um, but the point is they have an intelligence that we understand and that we can recognize because they look so similar to us. And so we have worked towards their increased rights. The, the notion being not 
for me that chimpanzees are any more deserving of rights than chickens or pigs or cows, but just that they can be, if you will, a keystone species. If we can get people to start thinking that somebody other than us deserves some protection, then hopefully it will be a slippery slope and we'll be down to the bottom of that slope with chickens in, in enough time. We also are their guardians. We have put them in entertainment, we have put them in research, and now we have to take care of them. They can't go back to the wild if you didn't know that. They have to stay in cages the rest of their lives. But we can take on the task of taking care of them. And so we've entered several cases and argued that we should be guardians, guardian ad litem for you lawyers in a particular case in which we can represent the interests of the chimpanzee separate and apart from the plaintiff and defendant. And in America, that's actually been extended now to dogs in certain cases. I, I'm not sure if the Michael Vick case is as popular here as it was over there, but Mr. Vick was a football player who was involved in dog fighting and, as far as I'm concerned, did more for us than most animal lawyers have done because he exposed that, that practice. And in that case, for the first time ever, a federal court judge appointed a guardian for the 40 dogs that were saved from his facility and his compound. And in the great state of Tennessee, uh, a judge also in another case, in a custody case between a, the parents and the partner of a deceased man who were arguing over the, a dog, granted guardianship to the dog. So those are all things I do, and they're all reasons why I go to work every day. But what happened to me in 1992 when I had that revelation was about this. I, this, this picture just demonstrates what, what uh, Katrina was talking about before. Everybody else is that little dot. Everything we've talked to up until now. And the large percentage of animals, in terms of numbers, are farmed animals. And not only that, they undoubtedly suffer the worst cruelty. They suffer cruelty for the most part from the day they're born until the day they die in whatever method that, that death is. And however long or short that death may be. That's the state of the world. It's the state of the world here in Australia and in America. Animals are commodities. They're pieces of meat. They're products we're going to use. And we don't consider them to be sentient beings, but they are. So we go down on the farm and we try to change what's going on there. But we're not talking about this farm. We're not talking about what everybody either thinks is happening or wants to think is happening. Uh, we're talking about the reality. But this is reality if they were treated the way they should be. It's why we fight, if you will. They have sentiency. They have intelligence. They understand what they're doing. They appreciate the good things in life, like a good bath. They like to go swimming. They know when things smell good. They like the soft feel of hay, like we like the soft feel of a bed. Every one of these animals we're talking about, every one of these animals that you eat or whose products you eat, have family lives if we let them have them. Their young stay with them. Their young care about them. When young cows are taken away from their mothers so that we can drink their mother's milk, the mothers scream and cry for up to seven days. That's not anecdotal. That's scientific. That's reported. They're socially cooperative like we are. They may not all sit in a, in a room like this, but they'll all walk around on the farm together. They won't bother each other. They certainly won't kill each other. But that's not what's happening. Yes, there may be farms here in Australia, and there are certainly farms in California that look like this. But 99% of the meat and milk and dairy that you get comes from places with a stark contrast. I'm not sure how bad this looks to you, but these animals never leave these pens. They stay here until the day that they are pork or bacon or ham. They have not one shred of their lives, their natural lives, led. Industry says occasionally in defense when they're bold enough to say, well, they can still live and breathe and excrete. That's not enough as far as I'm concerned. And so we try to change that. We've talked a little bit about, um, just a little bit, so I'll tell you a little bit more, about sows in production, mothers in production. Again, remember, these are mothers just like any of you who've been a mother or any of you who had a mother. So I think that covers everybody. Um, the sows are mothers for their entire lives, much shorter than their lives would be. But they start out as sows in gestation. Gestation crates, gestation meaning pregnancy. As Justice Kirby described, those crates are what you're looking at. It's, it's um, shorter and narrower than the pig herself. So for her entire life, 
she is pressed against metal steel bars. Again, remember, it's just like if you were pressed against metal steel bars for your entire life and could never move, and all you could do was stand up and lay down. That's the life for sows who raise the pigs who become ham and pork. In general, as I understand it, the pork industry then actually discards the sows. They don't even use them for anything. They're just trash. Animals are not trash, but to the pork industry, they are. So once they become spent, another industry term, meaning they can no longer produce the um, number of young in a pregnancy that's desired, they're thrown out with the trash. Their young go on to, be, to come on our tables. There's another shot. That's how they are. They can't move. Imagine living like that. Um, one other factor about the, the pigs, in addition to this confinement, which I, I submit would be enough for anybody to say, I don't want to be involved in this. There are extremely cruel practices which are committed on them on a regular basis. Just some examples. None of them with anesthesia. So again, just the pain it is. They are castrated. Their teeth are clipped. Their tails are docked. Just imagine going up to your dog with a big shears and cutting off his tail. Think about how you think he might feel. You're right. That's how he would feel. Or, gentlemen, think about someone coming up and castrating you without anesthesia. That's how the pigs feel. It doesn't get any better for chickens. Some argue it gets worse. I'm sorry, that's the pigs. Um, they also, when they are meat pigs, they are kept in these facilities where they are constantly pushed against each other. So you've all got your nice little chairs there. Think about if there were no chairs and I made you all sit in this little spot down here. That's the way the pigs live. And not just for the 45 minutes you have to listen to me, but for their entire lives. No better for the chickens, arguably worse. As Justice Kirby said, an A4 piece of paper. We call them eight and a half by 11 in America, but I'm very familiar with them too. Um, that's where they are their entire lives. They can never do any of the natural behaviors that chickens are involved in. That's where your eggs come from. Tens of thousands of them are loaded onto trucks. Tens of thousands at a, on a regular basis to be carted across America. And in the facilities, there they are. Dark houses, which are, the light is controlled to, to control the production. And of course, you can only get eggs from a female chicken. So if you're a male chick, I'm not sure, maybe it's better, but that's where you go the day you're born, the trash. Sometimes you're sent through a wood chipper. Sometimes you're just put in a dumpster to die with the rest of your brothers. Veal calves, you've probably heard about that because in, in the 80s that became a big cause celeb and even in America we stopped eating so much veal. Veal calves do not get out of their crates. They are stuck in their crates or they're stuck in stanchions for their entire lives, thousands of them. So how do we change it? We look to the law. We're lawyers. That's what we do. So how about federal law? Should be some good protection in America uh, for re regarding animal protection. There is not one federal anti-cruelty law. People find that shocking. I imagine you'd find that shocking that that's the case in Australia as well. Because we think, well, somebody must be watching out. Everybody, most people say to me, well, I know there's anti-cruelty laws. Doesn't that take care of it? No, it doesn't. Something called the Animal Welfare Act I mentioned earlier in America doesn't cover farmed animals. Sorry, guys, you're out of luck. But people think the opposite. There are actually two laws, two federal laws in America that cover farmed animals. The first one is the 28-hour law. So imagine being in a truck like that or like that for 27 hours and 50 minutes without food, stopping, without water. That's what any body can do legally to an animal in America. After 28 hours, they have to give them five hours of rest. They're trucked across America. But remember, it's been mentioned before, in addition to all those farmed animals in that circle, we could separate it out again. 90% of the animals, 9 billion in America every year, I guess 450 million in Australia are chickens. And in America, the United States Department of Agriculture has declared that chickens don't apply or don't fit within the 28-hour law. So they're not protected at all. And it took until 2006 for the USDA to say, oh, well, trucks apply, even though trucks is the way the animals are trucked across. They said only trains apply because the law was written 100 years before. Tens of thousands on a truck. 
The other law in America that supposedly protects animals protects them at the very, very end of their life, and I submit is really a joke. And I don't say that lightly, but it's the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act. How do you humanely kill an animal? Well, if before you kill him, it seems like you should render him unconscious. And that is indeed the first requirement in this law. 1901A says that animals can be shacked and hung upside down. That's the safe way to do it to make sure we don't get any, any diseases if they're unconscious. But then because kosher slaughter and other ritual forms of slaughter require a conscious animal, they said, well, the other way to do it is don't render them unconscious. How can they both be humane? That was challenged. And the court said, well, Congress decided both ways were humane. So I guess both ways were humane. And additionally, since kosher slaughter was the issue, and that's a, a religious practice, the challenge was under the United States First Amendment, you have similar laws here that say you can't mix religion and law. But the court said no, because it has a secular purpose, this humane purpose. And lo and behold, last year, uh, with an appeal pending probably coming up this year, the USDA stood by its position that chickens don't have any coverage under the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act. So again, remember how many, 90% of the animals who are slaughtered in America are covered by no laws just about. So that line is live chickens about to be placed in boiling water. That's how they get to die. So we give up with the feds. We go to the state laws. What can we do there? As a matter of fact, we've got some pretty good cruelty laws in America. Look at all those words. Those are words from most of the cruelty statutes in America. Looks like they apply to what I'm talking about, right? They're certainly overloaded, they're overdriven, it's unjustifiable, the pain, they're cruelly treated. Uh, there's situations of neglect and omission. I, don't, I won't go through every word, but it all fits, right? Wrong. 35 states say, oh, cruelty law is, is, a, is the law of the, of the state, but doesn't apply to either any farmed animal or standard farmed animal practices. All the practices I've described to you, both the, con both the confinement and the unanesthetized castration, et cetera, are standard practices, and therefore they're exempt from the cruelty laws. So we've had to get creative, and we've done that. Um, we've challenged uh, horse slaughter based on laws that say you can't slaughter horses for human consumption based on the cruelty behind that, and have had that upheld. We are currently in litigation against the meat industry, which wants to take animals who are down, and this is what downed animals look like. They can't get up because they're too sick or injured, in the slaughterhouse yard to get up. This, calf has, this cow has had her neck broken after her calf was taken away from her. And we have litigated that particular case, both because of the cruelty and because these are some of the diseases, just a, an a sample on these two slides, of some of the diseases you can get either from animals who've been in, in big production or even from eating the animals. And don't let anybody walk away saying, I said you can get swine food from eating pork. But Intensive confinement has caused the problems we are seeing today. That case is currently in litigation. You've got rights here in Australia like we do in America as taxpayers, as citizens. And so we've used what's called the taxpayer claim to challenge the government's involvement with these practices which we contend are cruel and illegal. This practice in particular, in 2008, we challenged what's called calf ranching. It's just like veal, veal calves, only calves who are dairy calves, are taken from their mothers at day one, sent to another place, and kept in these stanchions for six months for a variety of reasons that are good business, but certainly cruelty. And the state subsidizes this by giving breaks to those who are involved in this practice. So we sued on that basis, and as often happens, we lost. But let me stress that a loss is not a loss like it is in business, where you have to pay somebody because the public found out about this. People were alarmed and upset. Recently in California, we passed a law that will bar this kind of practice, and I have to believe it's in part and parcel because of that case. Consumer protection you have here, too. Cases that say, you're lying to me about the product I'm getting. Either you say it's humanely treated or it's cage-free, or maybe it's just that when I walk into the supermarket, I expect that the animals I'm eating were not treated in violation of the law. Well, in California, we have a law that says if an animal is confined, he or she has to have adequate exercise. Um, sorry, that's the next case. Um, this is the, the labeling case, is the PETA case, also known as the unhappy cows case. In that case, the California Milk Advisory Board, an arm of the government, 
entitled to advertise to get California to get people to buy California dairy products had the ads that you see on top which say great cheese comes from happy cows and happy cows come from California the idea being as a consumer you want to buy products from happy cows cows who are treated humanely below is the way the cows in California are really treated 95 percent of the cows in California never see a blade of grass they live in lots that are either mud in the winter or hard dirt in the summer and they have horrible diseases that are described in these exhibits from our complaint. You can see the size of those uh, udders. And so we sued, claiming that there was a misrepresentation which was admitted by the California Milk Advisory Board. And as often happens in our cases, we lost simply on a procedural issue which said that the California Milk Advisory Board was not a person under the statute, not an appropriate organization, because it was a government subsidized organization admittedly lying to the people as it advertised milk. Here's the other pig case, consumer protection cases brought by consumers or animal protection groups. So in this particular case, we had the Animal Legal Defense Fund and three purchasers of pork suing over this particular practice, the practice being keeping the pigs confined that I've described, based on the fact that this practice is illegal under the California law I just mentioned, which says they need adequate exercise, any animal that's confined. According to industry, that's adequate exercise in California. That case was settled because the industry called up and said, okay, we're going to pull all the cows out of California. And they did. That's what we call a win. Um, there's also a connection between Americans and Australians. Oh, wait, he's got a picture of Adidas up. You know where we get our Adidas? Right there. Adidas are made from kangaroo skin. In California, we decided we didn't like the methods that kangaroos were killed, especially the joeys who were bashed and decapitated. But in general, it just didn't seem like a nice way of killing animals. Not that we have any way to govern what happens in Australia, but Californians decided that was no good. And so in order to protect what, for us, are just some of the most amazing animals in the world from one of the most amazing countries in the world, we, we had this statute that said, no kangaroos can be brought in, no kangaroo skins, no kangaroo leather. And therefore, Adidas would be out of business in California. We won that case at the California Supreme Court. And here's another one of our ways in which we lose. The industry, because this is a, this is a movement about Davids, and the Davids are Professor Sankoff and people who work in the field, and Goliaths. So we need people who know how to litigate to come to our assistance. And in my practice, I have probably 30 at any time pro bono lawyers working for me of various levels uh, who do this work because they are learning about the problems with animals. But you also need some key players on your team. And don't get me wrong, you can't do anything without them. You have to have somebody watching the media at all times. <laughs> somebody who really can look for those animal-related issues. You've also got to get somebody who can read the briefs and appreciate the, the points you are putting forward. Otherwise, you may never be able to sell it to a court. So you got to find one of those experts, too. And most important, the factory farms uh, are they're closed to us. They're especially closed to people like me and Professor Sankoff and Katrina and Brian. They don't let us in anymore. But you've got to figure out a way to get somebody in there, get the information so you can file the lawsuits. So you need a private investigator, somebody they won't know about. She is available. She flies only first class on Qantas. But any time you want her, she's there. There is a future for animal law, and there's a future for animals. In, in the 30 years or so that animal law has been going on in America, and the short time in Australia, the animal law movement has made incredible strides. Voices has done some amazing things. I have never been in a room in all of America with this many people in one place. I have to attribute that both to the heart of Australians and the power of what Voices has done here. I thank you all. <laughs>